Mr. Chairman, as a result of the high rate of inflation over the last 10 years, real wages and salaries are at the moment very low indeed. At the lowest level, the monthly wage is not even enough to buy a bunch of matoki or five kilograms of maize flour. Welcome back to Owanapedia, your one-stop center for Uganda's history with I, Tony Geoffrey Owana, and Hapat Semyan managing the lenses. Mm -hmm. As we munch toke biscuits and down it with the Uzima water, we are continuing with the 1986 budget as presented by NRM's first finance minister, Professor Ponsiano Serumaga Molema. He told the parliament presided over by Speaker Yoweri Museveni that by the beginning of 1986, the only viable export was coffee, and that coffee was only possible because it could grow even when neglected. Professor Mlema has more for us. While other export crops like cotton and tea already show promising signs of recovery, the country will not expect substantial earnings from these crops this year. Coffee exports amounted to 143,000 tons in 1979 and declined to a level of 133,000 tons in 1984 and then increased again somewhat to 151,500 tons in 1985. The decline in coffee production may, however, not fully reflect the true situation. A lot of Uganda coffee has systematically been smuggled out of the country by both individuals, and it would appear official agencies as well. Cotton, tea, and tobacco continue to be exported, but in quantities that do not demand any particular mention here. In 1982, however, maize appeared for the first time as one of Uganda's exports and reached a level of 30,000 tons in 1984, but declined substantially in 1985 to a level of 9,800 tons. Unit prices of our exports continued to fluctuate in response to forces beyond the control of the developing world. Although international agreements under the International Coffee Organization have helped a great deal in bringing about relative stability in coffee prices on the world market. The value of Uganda's total exports reached a level of 380 US dollars, so, sorry, 380 million US dollars in 1985. But nearly all this consists of earnings from coffee. Uganda's imports in 1983, 1984, and 1985 were valued at US dollars 428 million, US dollars 342 million, and US dollars to raise enough currency to finance imports, as well as political difficulties which existed during 1985. Drawings from the IMF were getting exhausted by 1984. And because the financial program with the fund was not renewed, 
Uganda's capacity to import was severely constrained. Mr. Chairman, the country experienced substantial trade deficits between 1980 and 1982. Although by 1985, we had recorded a surplus in the trade balance, largely because the imports had been disrupted by political and military problems the country was experiencing. On the capital account, Uganda utilized substantial external capital. And by 1983, we had recorded a substantial surplus of $27 million. This improvement reflected substantial use of borrowed resources, particularly from the IMF. Uganda, therefore, had relied largely on external financing to finance imports. However, repurchases from the IMF, that is to say repayment of our debt, was already in excess of our drawings from the fund by up to $10 million by 1984, thus marking the beginning of the balance of payments difficulties which the country faces at the present time. On the international scene, Mr. Chairman, Uganda, like other countries, witnessed recent sharp decreases in oil prices. This decline would have benefited the developing countries greatly. However, we do not control the oil markets and have to rely on the operations of the commercial organizations which market oil worldwide. Uganda has yet to get full benefit of low oil prices. While the effect of low oil prices is expected to be positive and lead to higher rates of growth in the developed countries, this cannot necessarily be said of developing nations. The developing world is constantly faced with two major problems. The first is the currency fluctuations which frequently affect their balance of payment positions. And the second is fluctuations in prices of their exports. In regard to this latter problem, Mr. Chairman, it is not worthy that over the last few months, the price of coffee on the world markets has dropped by as much as a dollar per kilogram. Although at the moment it's beginning to rise again. This has considerably depressed our foreign earnings. Furthermore, the developing world, including Uganda, continues to be a net export of capital to the developed world. This phenomenon continues even at this time. These flows consist of transfers of capital by commercial undertakings and investors who operate in the developed world, as well as flows on account of principal and interest on various credits raised in the developed countries. I would now like to say a little about producer prices for, for price-controlled commodities. In May this year, Mr. Chairman, government announced substantial increases in the prices paid to farmers for controlled export crops. It is the policy of this government to offer higher and higher prices for those commodities as a means of providing an incentive for greater production, as well as redressing the imbalance between the rural and the urban sectors of the economy. However, because of the current conditions in international commodity markets, 
it is impossible for government to review upwards the prices currently payable to the producers. As suggested above, with regards to what prices for coffee, the government is only making an effort to maintain prices to the farmer at, at the level at which they are now. Prices, price increases are therefore impossible in the circumstances. However, government will continue the policy of offering the best possible prices in the light of world market conditions. The price for cotton in particular will be reviewed before the commencement of the coming planting season. The development program. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, the government is in the process of formulating an investment program which will reflect the economic policies of the NRM government. The program will not only focus its main attention on production, but will also put emphasis on developing an integrated economy so that the economy is oriented to produce as much as possible those commodities, goods, and equipment that will enable productive sectors, especially industry and agriculture, to support each other. Uganda should produce more of its basic needs within the country itself. The investment program is in the final stages of discussion. And when it is published, it will indicate broadly what Ugandans plan to do for themselves and the nature of assistance they expect from financial organizations and the friendly countries. This budget cannot therefore take into account the full and the final recommendations of the investment program. Although during this financial year, certain projects in the program will be started. This will include the rehabilitation of our roads as well as some industrial projects which the government considers to be urgently required. But even before the investment plan is released, government is already implementing those policies that are fundamental to its economic policy. Uganda intends to depend on its own resources as much as possible in developing its economy. In this connection, we will primarily use our foreign currency resources to pay for petroleum products as well as drugs for both human and animal needs, to purchase raw materials and capital imports, to produce those consumer goods which the people need, as well as agricultural imports to promote more production for local consumption and for export. Our foreign resources will also be used to purchase capital goods and transport equipment the country cannot at the, at the moment produce. Resources will also be used to pay for consumer goods which our industries cannot produce at the moment. We shall also use our resources to pay for scholastic materials needed in our educational institutions and also to repay the country's external debts, most of which could have been avoided. <coughs> Government has also embarked on measures which are aimed at reducing demands on our foreign exchange resources. We have already reached agreements with a number of countries under which we will exchange commodities or goods with each other so that the need for use of convertible currencies is reduced. In this regard, Mr. Chairman, 
government is launching an export drive involving non-traditional exports such as maize, beans, timber, hides and skins, simsim, soya beans, and others. Government calls upon all persons to redouble their efforts in the production of these commodities and the guarantee is a sure market to the producers at competitive prices. Foreign investment. Mr. Chairman, the investment program will make allowance for and encourage the investment by investors abroad. A law exists to protect such investment as well as to give incentives to those who wish to invest in Uganda. The Foreign Investment Protection Act of 1964 and the subsequent decree of 1977 give details of what the investors need to do before they start on their projects in Uganda. That law provides for a committee of senior officers who are supposed to examine the nature of the proposed investment and determine whether it is in line with the country's development objectives. If the committee is satisfied, it makes recommendations to the Minister of Finance who, sat, who signs a certificate of approved status, thus allowing the investor the right to remit dividends and interest on any money he might have brought in from abroad to finance the project in the country. It should be emphasized, however, that each project has to be discussed with the government on a case-by-case -case, case -case basis to ensure that it, its future operations are in line with government's economic po policy objectives and will produce those goods and services that the country considers a priority. I would now like to say a word about the properties currently managed by the Departed Asians Property Custodian Board. Government has already started on work relating to the final resolution of issues relating to properties left behind by, by Departed Asians. We are at the moment examining the law governing their sale or return to the former owners as the law currently stands. Amendments to the law may be necessary. New legislation may also be necessary, say with regards to land tenure, to provide for certain modes of sale and ownership that cannot be accommodated in the existing law. The task force consisting of lawyers, experts on urban affairs, bankers and others is currently examining the necessary procedures and the modalities to be followed. Their recommendations will be submitted to government for final decision. After this process, such properties as shall be candidate for sale shall be valued and disposed of. Recommendations are also expected from the task force on the best ways of deploying and utilizing the proceeds from these sales. I would now, Mr. Chairman, like to turn to the 1985-1986 budgetary outturn. Mr. Chairman, the budgetary situation during the year 1985-86 was abnormally difficult. And the budgetary performance was more absurd than ever before.
The original estimates for recurrent expenditure for financial year 1985-86 was shillings 213 billion, while development expenditure was estimated at 144.6 billion. In the course of the year, these figures were revised by supplementary estimates to shillings 343.7 billion and the shillings 170.6 billion for recurrent and development expenditure respectively, giving a total expenditure of 514.3 billion shillings. <coughs> On the revenue side, the original estimates for the financial year 85-86 were shillings 240.8 billion for the recurrent tax revenue and the shillings 73.1 billion for development revenue in that order. The revised tax revenue estimates for the year are shillings 276.6 billion and the shillings 125.8 billion for recurrent and development expenditure, respectively, making a total of 402.5 billion shillings, as against the original estimates of 314 billion. The outturn for 1985-86 budget, therefore, gives an overall deficit of shillings 104.6 billion. Many factors made it very difficult, and in some cases impossible, to live within the original budgeted amounts, and consequently necessitated revision of expenditure estimates by suppl supplementary provisions. The main factors that led to this are as follows. First, Government services which were not originally catered for in the budget, namely provision of emergency relief for the people in the war ravaged areas, especially Luelo Triangle, Aroa, Moyo, Moroto, and Cotido. Secondly, the implementation of government policy to provide free education in the World Triangle, Arua Moyo, and the two districts of Karamoja. There was also an increase of salaries and wages due either to underestimation of police and prisons requirements in the original budget or increases in the number of soldiers in the Minister of Defense in the course of the year, and an upward revision of their salaries in the second half of the year, sorry, in the, in the first half of the year. In addition, government had to acquire new equipment and transport facilities for the Army, that is uniforms, mattresses, vehicles, etc. Thirdly, the continued depreciation of the shilling, which affected the number of payments made in foreign currency. For example, external loan servicing, remittances to our missions abroad, students' allowances overseas, overseas purchases and contributions to international organizations, as well as official travel abroad. Firstly, internally there was the rising cost of maintenance and the feeding of, the, of soldiers, the police, prisons personnel, as well as prisons inmates, students in secondary schools, colleges, and Macquarie University, hospital patients, and the paramedics. These costs constantly 
rows. Fifth, the rate of revenue collection was far less than the rate of expenditure, as indicated by expenditure demand of ministries and departments. Details of the outturn of the 1985-86 tax and development revenues and external grants and loans are in the financial statement and the revenue estimates published today. I would now like to look at the forecast for 1986-1987. Mr. Chairman, the main policy objectives of the 1986-87 budget will focus on financing and rehabilitating government services that have been neglected as far as recurrent budget is concerned, and repair of many state assets that have been damaged during the recent wars. These include buildings, government institutions, schools, hospitals, roads, machinery, etc. These will be covered in the development budget. The budget will also lay emphasis on providing means of livelihood to the population in the war affected areas under the Ministry of Rehabilitation. In the 1986-87 budget, the overall revenues including foreign grants among others, are forecast to increase by about 90%, whereas the overall expenditure is expected to increase by about 119%. The total estimate of revenue published today in the financial statement is the shillings 777.8 billion shillings. Tax revenue is estimated at 487.3 billion. Appropriation in aid is estimated at shillings 16.8 billion. to be shillings 273.7 billion from the following sources. A, dividends from government-owned companies or companies in which government has shares. The sum of 4.1 billion is expected. B, IDA 1 and IDA 2 and other project accounts we should realize uh, 56.5 billion. C, the Kenya Competition Agreement Fund is expected to contribute 40.6 billion shillings. D, the sale of buses is expected to bring in 4.4 billion shillings. A, external grants to bring in 72.3 billion and external loans this should bring in proceeds of 95.8 billion. The total estimates of expenditure is budgeted at 1 trillion 127.5 billion. <coughs> Recurrent expenditure is estimated at 509.7 billion. <coughs> Statutory recurrent is budgeted at 134 billion shillings. Development expenditure is estimated at 474.1 billion shillings. And the statutory development 
is estimated at 9.8 billion. The total revenue and the total expenditure, therefore, Mr. Chairman, give a deficit of 349.7 billion shillings. This is to be financed from borrowing, from the banking system, and also from non bank sources. Subject to government decision, part of the proceeds from the sale of the custodian properties may be applied to the financing of this deficit. Mr. Chairman, most of the parastatal bodies continue to depend on government assistance for their operations. Government proposed contribution to various parastatal bodies amounting to shillings 22.7 billion is included under the Ministry of Finance Development Budget. Out of this amount, shillings 7 billion is to cater for partial capitalization of Uganda Airlines, while shillings 9.5 billion goes towards UDC's share capital. This government places a lot of emphasis on discipline within government and the way public funds are handled. This emphasis is necessary because rehabilitation needs in this country at the moment are pressing and many. That is the reason why the budget deficit is so large. The Treasury will therefore place strict controls on the use of funds by releasing money to ministries for only real needs which should be properly documented. By reducing the number and size of government delegations traveling abroad, and in many cases, request our embassies abroad to attend meetings where Uganda will be required without sending officers from Kampala. By insisting on proper authority before purchases can be financed with public funds. By ensuring that each ministry spends money in amounts not exceeding those provided in the budget to be authorized today. Mr. Chairman, As a result of the high rate of inflation over the last 10 years, real wages and salaries are at the moment very low indeed. At the lowest level, the monthly wage is not even enough to buy a bunch of matoki or five kilograms of maize flour. Government has therefore decided to increase the total wage bill of government by 50%. And provide this increase in individual scales in such a way that the 50% increase in total wages and salaries will range from token increases at the top scales to well over 50% increases at the bottom scales. Eh. At the lowest level, the salary of a public servant could not buy a bunch of matoke, all five kilograms of ugali. Ugali is portion. That was in 1985-86, and that is the post-liberation time when the NRM first presented its budget on the 23rd of August, 1986. This should tell you what the situation was 34 years ago. It should tell you. But Oana is returning with the final part.